Hi everyone, welcome to Track Talk. Today we have a very special guest. It's factory Hyundai Motorsport driver, Canadian Mark Wilkins. Mark's going to be joining us at the Honda Indy in a couple weeks, racing for Brian Hurd Autosport. It's a great conversation, super insightful, uh, great for any Canadian motorsport fan or Hyundai fan. Get some insight into the brand, his racing career, thoughts on the aims this season so far. He's in a tight battle for the championship and uh, mindset hidden into Indy. So we hope you guys enjoy the conversation. Welcome to Track Talk, Mark Wilkins. And Mark Wilkins, winners last time out. Under a wing ago, Robert Wiggins. Welcome to Track Talk, Mark. Really excited to have you. We're looking forward to having the Brian, or- uh, Brian Herda Autosport team at Honda Indy this year. Um, I guess we'll kind of get into, you know, what do you do during your off season or do you have any hobbies or for fun or what do you do to stay sharp? You know, well, thanks for having me and uh, really excited for Toronto Indy. Um, the streets of Toronto is one of my my favorite courses and just street circuits in general. So really excited. Um, off season. Well, home for me is uh, north of Toronto near uh, Creemore. So I'm a big winter weather enthusiast. So lots of snowmobiling to try to stay sharp in the winter. Um, you know, the lion's share of our race program is in the summer. So whether it's shoulder seasons, um, training, uh, winter snowmobiling, skiing uh, with my son and, um, you know, just, just just generally trying to stay active and, and focused for um, the, the typical sort of 10 or 11 race season that we that we have. Um, but snowmobiling has always been a big part of m- me since I was a kid. Um, just the need for speed. It's fun. Uh, it's like the Nürburgring of the North. Uh, it's a good challenge. Um, it keeps you mentally sharp because um, they are quick um, and you never know what's coming. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, the, there's a lot of things that can get you in trouble, um, which means you have to be on, on the ball. And I, I think a lot of that just really translates to what we do in the race car. So I've always looked at both as kind of being equally as fun, um, but both feed off each other. And it's a great way to stay sharp in the North when there's not so much seat time um, in the race car. And building off that as well, in terms of not having a lot of seat time up here, are you doing a lot of stuff on the simulator for in the Hyundai? Yeah, it's a good question. So I helped a little bit on the development of the Elantra and TCR uh, for iRacing. Um, and so I have a simulator at home. Um, I've actually been uh, doing an event with uh, the hip motorsport guys uh, for uh, sick kids uh, every winter um, in January. And so they've got a great setup, great rigs. And then, you know, because I live a bit far from them, I tend to use my home uh, setup mostly just for practice, to be honest, um, less racing, more just lapping and just coming up to speed um, for, for tracks that we don't typically run on. Uh, it's just such a great tool. So absolutely, it's it's part of kind of the training routine, if you will, just to, to stay focused when there isn't uh, isn't all that seat time that we'd love to have all the time. You said that uh, your son is karting. Um, does he, is he pretty into the sim as well? Yeah. So Levi, he just turned seven. So we kind of, we've got him at the most sport cart club and, and he's did his first race and we've been doing a little bit of practice and he's kind of just um, trying it out, sampling it. He's kind of feeling out the things he likes. And so far I'm not surprised he's really enjoying it. Um, sim wise. Yeah. We've stacked, I think about 10 books on the race seat and move the seat and the pedals and everything to get him so he can, he can use it. So he's the steering wheels, you know, right up to here. And, <laughs> and so of course it's, it's like, well, you have to drive the Hyundai. Cause that's, you know, that's daddy's car. And he's like, well, I'd really like to drive an Indy car. <laughs> so it's like, all right, all right I got I'm not going to fight you on that one, but um, yeah, no, he, he enjoys it. Um, and you know, it's fun to kind of see him get into the karting side of it where I started and, and then at the same time have this new technology that I didn't have when I was karting uh, that he can use to kind of help hone in on his skills a little bit. So yeah, it's fun to watch. Just out of my own curiosity, because I'm a big iRacing nerd. What's that process like when you're working with them developing uh, a model for their car? Yeah, it was pretty neat. I mean, they basically just from the back end side of it, just gave, gave me access to get into to sample the car in the test phases. So they would just ask for feedback generally related to how it compared to the real car. So, you know, I, I would talk to them a lot about the balance, uh, whether I felt like the, the, the model had too much understeer or in what part of the corner phase the car felt m- most accurate um, and brake feel, obviously throttle um linearity and how that how that all builds um aerodynamics downforce 
Um, and then obviously like driving some of the other TCR car models in relation to have a little bit of comparison, um, but really just like parlaying the real life version to the sim version and trying to get that as close and accurate as possible and kind of kind of connecting between that real side and the sim side and the way they look at how they build the car models versus how I drive the, the car in reality and really trying to connect those dots because it's uh, it's a bit of a different world, obviously, as you can imagine. And so trying to give them the, that most accurate feedback that they understand so that they can go into the software and make the changes to make the car react more like I'm trying to describe it. Um, it was a fun process, to be honest. And we did, we made the car significantly different, I'd say, than from where we started to where it ended. And uh, and and it was pretty cool to have a, a part in, in that process. Yeah, that's really cool. And you, you guys nailed it too, because I think that's probably the best car, the best TCR car in iRacing. Perfect. Oh, that's good to hear. Talk to us a little bit about um, your mindset and, you know, maybe what, what your mindset or the way that you like to think before you go out there and race. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, for me, it's all trying to get the most rest possible. So with a young family, rest is sometimes hard to come by. And so, you know, just getting to races a bit early, um, getting to, to sleep early and just being as mentally uh, rested as possible, getting to the track, um, you know, eating the proper food, having a good, you know, good breakfast and kind of the simple, silly stuff. Um, but then getting like in the zone and getting focused for practice, um, sometimes, you know, putting the headphones on and just putting some music on that kind of amps you up and ramps you up into it a little bit, especially if it's an early morning session and, you know, you've got your cup of coffee or, you know, you're just trying to kind of get going. And I think for, um, you know, leading into Toronto, I think we have an early session one day or an early race. And so, um, you know, it'll be getting, getting up and prepped and, you know, guess just getting amped up enough, um, to perform at the highest level right away. Um, so it's tricky. It really depends on the race. It depends on the atmosphere a little bit too. Um, like I really feed off a lot of, we have a lot of support, a lot of fan support, um, if we have, you know, people from head office uh, from Hyundai that are coming out. So our, our race at Laguna in May, for example, we had a whole slew of, of Hyundai uh, people uh, come out and that really like amped me up. It just gets me excited. And, and so it really just depends on where we are in the environment and kind of feeding off that a little bit to, uh, to get ready. But uh, otherwise, I don't know, I've been doing it such a long time now that kind of just get in the car and, and just try to, work through the, the things we need to do first and foremost to start the sessions. And it's been a similar process for a number of years. So it's, I mean, maybe like a, a well-oiled machine, it kind of just flows. And, you know, we, we uh, typically like um, the sort of similar process of just going through all those procedures the same way works well and, and it's good. But then we have weekends like we had last weekend at Watkins Glen, which really didn't go very well for us. And we kind of, it was a bit of an eye opener about well how how did it go so far off course um, and and it just reminds us like how difficult all this is in motorsport and you know you go from a win a month earlier to um, effectively a DNF and you kind of scratch your head and go well, <laughs> how did that all happen but I guess that's the beauty of, of motorsport um, and that it's it's highly variable high highs and low lows. Yeah, absolutely. Makes the makes the wins really good, that's for sure. So Sam races um in the Formula 1600s and you know, he talks about mindset every so often. What advice would you give to, you know, maybe somebody in an amateur level about what they should be thinking about before they get into the car? I always say um focus on one corner at a time. It's very easy to get caught up in the, what's going on around you. There's always a lot of, of activity. There's always, you're always being pulled a lot of different directions, whether it's an interview or media um, or your engineer needs to talk to you or whatever. It's easy to get really overwhelmed with all the different things happening. And so my big thing is just to try to back away from it a little bit, look at the big picture, um, try to compartmentalize um, what's going on and, if you kind of go in there um, with just a little bit of a clearer focus on, you know, okay, I'm going to have to do this media, but I'm going to, that's, you know, we have a set time for that. So we'll get that dealt with. And I know I need to speak to my engineer. And when I get on track, get the helmet on a bit early, sit in the car, relax, take some deep breaths, 
and just focus on what you're doing. Focus on each corner. Um, I worked with uh, um, some uh, performance like psychologists in the past when I started in the early days. And that was really the advice they gave was, you know, don't think about the end result. Because if you think about the end result, I really want to win. Everyone really wants to win. So how do I get there? What's the process to get from start to finish? And, and to me, I always, even to this day in the car, will say in my helmet when I'm racing one corner at a time, because if you're leading, you get in your head, you can start thinking about, well, it's only like three or four more laps and then I'm going to, I could win. And then, you know, your mind starts wandering off what you're doing. You make a little mistake and all of a sudden, you know, you get past and, and, or, and, or it's, it's a bigger incident, something like that. So just focusing on what's happening in the moment. And, and I think that's my favorite thing about racing is there's so much distraction in the world that when you're racing, you're there in the moment and you're just driving to your best. And as long as you can keep your head focused on that single task in the moment, I mean, that would be my, my biggest advice. Obviously coming up here before Indy, you guys had to CTMP for the IMSA weekend last year. You guys won there. I remember that. I was at that race. Pretty awesome drive from you and Robbie. Um, kind of want to talk about that maybe a bit last year and then also kind of thoughts heading into the race this year. Sure. Yeah, no, last year, um, CTMP was a great race for Robert and I. It was, a, in fact, a, kind of a surreal week because we won Watkins Glen, which was sort of a really big win um, for the two of us as a pairing and, and certainly for Robert. And then to come up to CTMP right in the middle of that, uh, Robert and Carly had Wesley. So Robbie actually wasn't at CTMP at all until the race. So he sort of said to me, I'm not going to be there. I don't even know if I'm going to be at the race. So have fun, set the car up, whatever you do, it'll be good. And I'll get in. And he made it back, uh, started dead last. We had very little expectation. It was like, you know what? Lots happened. We had a great weekend at Watkins. Just go out and have fun and then we'll see where we end up. Let's get some points. And the race just clicked. Robert passed a couple cars in the first lap um, of, of the weekend for him. Um, so he did two pace laps green and passed a few cars right away. And then by the time I got in, I think he was up to third. Um, and so it all of a sudden went from, well, maybe we'll get a half decent result to know well, maybe we could actually win this thing. And the pressure was on. So it was a, a tough race. It was a good race for the team. Um, and, you know, for Robert in front of hometown fans, uh, it was, it was pretty surreal that whole period of time. Um, and so this year, yeah, high expectations. I mean, unfortunately, I have to race Robert uh, this year because uh, we're not in the same car. So um, we'll the, the fans will have two Canadian drivers to cheer for uh, in different cars. So it's two opportunities, I guess, to, to win it. But uh, obviously, would you know, he wants to beat me and not want to beat him. And it'll be a fun race for sure. Um, but uh, really looking forward to getting back to CTMP. It's a, it's a great race. It's still a track that always humbles me. It's uh, it's like. Of all the places we go, it's always the one where it always takes a few laps to really get going. And I know that the first sort of two, three laps, you look at the lap time and go, man, how am I off that little bit? Like I, you know, really need to dig into it. And it's, uh, it's just that kind of place. So um, excited for that to race with Mason there. And, and our goal for Mason and I in the 98 is just to get back on track. We're still, we're actually tied for the points lead with Robert and Harry <laughs> going into CTMP. So the, the, the rivalry is close, but we're all great friends and we're all working together just to try to win another manufacturer's title for Hyundai first and foremost. But I know Robbie would love to win the championship and, and I would love to win it too. So it should be a fun weekend. Have you ever, it's my naivety here, but have you ever um, raced at Honda Indy before? Yes. So the last time, if I'm not mistaken, I'm aged myself a little bit. The last time I raced at Toronto Indy was in the Pearly World Challenge days, uh, 2014, um, in the GTS class. So, uh, and one, one by, I think the closest margin in Pirelli world challenge history it was like six, one thousandths of a second was the margin of victory. So it was very close. Um, it was a great battle, but I have very good memories of, of Toronto. I read about that. Was that the one where everyone was running out of fuel and you were third and like the first two cars ran out of fuel and you passed them at the line? So that was, that's dating myself even more. So that was Montreal in 2008 uh, in the day prototype. So yes, that, that was also the closest finish in Grand Am history. So I think I have that Grand Am hit record and the world challenge record. It was they were both almost identical in, in finishing time, but 
Um, no, this was uh, in the GTS days, um, running uh, with Kia, and um, I was racing, I think, Alec Udell in the Mustang, and I was leading, and he was coming up to the line, and we had run ourselves out of tires and was just trying to hang on in the last corner, and I think we, yeah, it was it was very close, but a great memory and a lot of fun, and, and so hoping for hoping for another good good race this year to try to do it again. What stands out to you the most about Honda Indy? You know, I just, I think I just love the fans. It's always such a popular race. Um, I love street circuits because there's no margin for error. I think a lot of racetracks these days, they've, they've made them really safe, which is obviously great. Um, but some of them have lost a little bit of character because, you know, a, um, a gravel trap or, or, you know, just grass is replaced by pavement. And, you know, so there's there's more, you can take more risk. Um, and if it goes wrong, you're typically, you know, okay. Uh, where on street circuits, there's no margin. It's like, you wanna be right up against the wall. You you know, if you scrape the mirror, you're doing a good job. Um, and, and, you know, but there's, with the bumpy nature of street circuits and no margin for error, not a lot of rubber down, not a lot of grip. Um, they're tricky and uh, they're, they demand um, really being focused and on your game. So you don't make a mistake because a mistake is pretty much you're, you're in the wall or, or out of the race. So um, that's what I'm looking forward to the most uh, about, about going to Toronto is just, yeah, that level of precision needed. And uh, yeah, it's just fun to race within the walls. Quick question, just going back to, to racing with Wickens. Did you ever try driving with the hand controls that they have rigged up on his car? Because I think what he's doing with that and how he's come back and can run at top pace is just incredible, like mind-blowing. So did you ever try that? Yeah, I mean, so just to say, Robert, what he, you know, just to take what you said, Sam, I mean, Robert is an incredible talent, always has been. I've always admired him um, throughout his career. And you're totally right. I mean, for him to drive the car the way he does at the limit uh, with the consistency and precision that he does is, is really mind boggling, honestly. Yes, I've tried it. Um, just going slow, not at, not at pace. It's something that, you know, obviously takes a great deal of uh, time to just get acclimatized to it because it just feels very unnatural. So the one big thing that Robert has to deal with is with the braking system is it's obviously um, has a, an assist to it because his hands can't generate that same pressure that your foot can. So he has to work with that system to modulate pressure, um, which you can imagine when you go into a brake zone, if you want light pressure and you just pull it lightly, sometimes it's very hard to get exactly what you want, where with your foot, you can be quite precise. And so I would say that what he's able to do with some of the limitations of that system is, is, is absolutely uh, incredible. And yes, having tried it, um, it's a lot going on in your hands. And even with the assist, his strength in his hands is incredible to do an hour plus in the car and pulling on that. I mean, it's not just that he pulls on that, but then the throttle and he's got a shift. And so the paddles and the throttle are all right there. And so to say, you know, it's all well to say like, well, yeah, you could, you could do it and it's possible. It's like, how do you do it at the limit without making a mistake for that long with the, with everything having in your hands? It's amazing. It's a, it's an incredible talent. And, and that's why I had to try it. Cause I just wanted to get a, a feel for what he had to deal with. And, and quite honestly, I, I don't know how he does it. I mean, I, I think like everything, I think you, you kind of learn and you adapt. And I think he did some work on that on the simulator um, to get prepared um, but yeah, it feels really unnatural, quite honestly. So what he's been able to figure out, and I know that if the system was even more refined, he would be able to extract even more pace. And so, no, he, he's an incredible talent and, and it's been, um, like I said, it's, I really enjoyed driving with him. Um, driving against him is, uh, <laughs> it, it keeps you honest. I tell you it's, it, it does. And we've, we've had a little bit of running around each other now with, with Laguna and then again, a little bit at Watkins, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. If you could race in any motorsport era of the past, which would it be and what series and what would the car? Well, I think, you know, the one I talk about the most, or at least talk to the kids about is we love watching the, all the formula one races and 
the V10 era of Formula One, like when I grew up, was just awesome. And I think it was the sound of those motors, just the the shriek. The I remember watching it. My, my dad was was racing um, at the Grand Prix. You know, I think it was in mid '90s or in and around there. And so as a kid, just you would watch the F1, and they come down into the hairpin. And you would just be like the sound and then the the rate at which they decelerated and, and took off. It was like, I'll never forget that. And when I hear old footage from the V10 era, I'm just like, man, that's, that was the pinnacle there. It just, just, just the whole um, experience of being at an F1 race when they had had those high revving V10s was I think very hard to replicate. And, and, you know, the, the cars obviously nowadays, the technology is incredible and it's all advanced a lot, but fundamentally just doesn't have that same like holy cow this is so crazy cool um like i think it did you know back in that era we do a hot lap section which is rapid fire kind of quick q a questions so the first one do you prefer wet or dry races i prefer dry races uh just because being on the limit is super fun with all the grip um yeah dry races and what's most important to you corner entry apex or exit always exit, but it all relates. It's all one, but I love a good exit just feels great. You know, you're going to get a good run to the next corner. And do you have a bucket list track that you haven't driven yet that you would like to? Yeah. The Nürburgring. The Nürburgring of the North isn't good enough for you. Eh? Oh, well, it's, yeah, it, it, just, it just keeps drawing me there. So no, I, I'm trying to figure out a way to get to Nürburgring yet, to be honest. <laughs> What's a bucket list event to attend as a fan? motorsports event to attend as a fan oh you know one thing i don't think i've really ever done is like a drag race um just because that i'm talking about the v10 era and that that like a drag race the thrill of that in the grandstands when they launch um i think would be incredible so i'd have to say do you have a favorite mario kart character um i what was what did i toad i think it was toad mushroom mushroom yeah yeah <laughs> yeah if you could use a mario kart power on track in real life what would it be probably the banana peels i don't know why but that just came to mind i'm gonna run with that here you go wiccans <laughs> exactly so who's been the most influential person in your uh racing career that's a really good question i would say i have to say my dad because he's the one that he did it and he won Le Mans in 2000 when i was a kid and kind of just getting into it and he did it as kind of more of a hobby, but was pretty successful in it. And um, so that just, he really kind of kickstarted my love and passion for motorsport. And then I've really never looked back from then. So I've always thought, man, I really would love to follow in his footsteps, but just make it, a, make it professional, make it what I do. And, and if I could do that, it would be pretty awesome. I have a follow-up question. I was just curious if... Um if you want any of your kids to race or um, are you kind of just going to let them figure it out and, and push them if they, if they want to? Yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, obviously just want them to do what makes them happy and, and I want to, you know, share in my passion for it with them. And if they're interested and they want to do it, then uh, great. And if not, that's fine. So I, we, we've got three kids um, and maybe, you know, if Levi decides he, he wants to, do it for fun, but not competitively. That's great. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do the same with the other kids and see what they think, um, and go from there. No pressure whatsoever. Speaking of winning big races, you mentioned your dad won at Le Mans. You won at the 12 hours of Sebring twice, correct? I know it, what, what class was it? It was a prototype challenge. Is that those were, yeah. So the, so in terms of big races, like I guess that I've won, I won the Rolex 24 in 2014. Um, so the 24 Daytona, and that was in a, a prototype challenge car. So uh, closed fender, open top um, uh, prototype. And uh, yeah, I think I've, I've kind of won all the big endurance races in, in North America, um, whether it be, and that's going back, I'm dating myself again, but like the ALMS days, um, and, uh, and then over in the, on the IMSA side. So, um, yeah, it's, I, the one I, I've never raced Le Mans. That's another one that I always had in my mind to do. And, and, you know, I always love the long endurance races, uh, 24 hour races, I find them like super challenging. And if you can do well, very re rewarding. So, um, yeah, uh, good memories of that and can't kind of believe how long ago that, that was now. 
but it's been fun racing production uh, production cars for uh yeah the better part of the last decade so um yeah it's been uh, it's been a good ride so far do you have a favorite one like if you could go back and you can only have one of those victories do you have one that kind of sticks out as the one you'd keep yeah, I think Daytona was pretty cool because I ran the Daytona 24 for a, a, a number of years and I in it's so hard. Like I, I think the first two years I ran, I raced with my dad and we finished third in the GT class. And he, I'll never forget him looking at me and saying, it's not this easy to get on the podium. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. It's two years in a row. We've been on the podium. Next year, we're going to win it. And then I don't think I finished the race for, I don't even know how many years, but I, it was like a big drought and then came back and had another podium and, and then to win it was just really emotional. Cause it, I think my first Daytona 24 was in 2004. So it was like a decade before I, before I won. And so many people, great drivers have not won it. So many great drivers have won it multiple times, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's such a tough race. And so to big play a part in that and, it was a great experience. It was fun as a great group of people. Um, and so that was super rewarding at the end. Explain your relationship with your team, with Brian Herta Autosport and like how important that is or some of the things that they they do that you can do without. Yeah, I mean, Brian Herta Autosport, um, this is my sixth year with Brian. And, um, you know, I just can't say enough about them as an organization. I was with them uh, from day one. So Michael Lewis and I were the two first drivers um, starting in 2018 with Hyundai's first end product, which was the i30N sold in Europe. And we raced that for a season before the Veloster N became available for the North American market. And so, you know, Brian, um, that relationship, the building of a brand with Hyundai, um, has really been like a dream opportunity, honestly. I've always dreamed of, I have a background in, in marketing and I always thought, man, I really love the automotive industry. I love road cars. I have a passion for road cars. And I'm like, I really want to work for a company where I can enjoy the road cars, but you know, they get to race them too. And I'm, And I thought if I could get a job like that, it would be my dream job. And so when I had the opportunity with Brian, um, and joined Michael Lewis is a great guy. He was a great co-driver. Um, we just kind of hit the ground running and, and Hyundai built a great product. So we started winning pretty quickly. Um, and then the Veloster was a great car and then the Elantra came out and they were all great cars. Um, and just the, the, the group of people that Brian was able to put together, the crew, um, watching the development of the team, the team grow. We ran um, as many as six cars uh, last year. And so like the, the team has grown, it's, it's com- consolidated, it's changed a lot. There's been, it's just a constant, like we're learning, we're improving, we're growing. And we've just had so much success. Um, I think as a result of just great team chemistry, great synergy, great people. Um, in the end, we've just been able to be successful through that and and been given a great product uh, to showcase. And that's just been super fun. Um, I love, you know, uh, um, Hyundai Canada has given me an Elantra N to Veloster and Elantra N to drive um, daily. And it's awesome. It's just the, the perfect runaround car for everything, track days, taking the kids to daycare, going to the cottage, you name it. And um, and so I've been able to enjoy those road trips to races in the, in the COVID time. Um, I don't know how many thousands of kilometers I've put on Hyundai's vehicles just going to and from races over the years. And I just love it because it's like a shared passion for the latest and greatest in technology on the roadside and then and then going out and, and racing them on track. And it's been really cool to watch sort of the the whole growth of of the brand um in North America. I and mean, there's just so many like awesome owners that we see out to the to the races now and they love their cars. So it's like really like come together, I guess. And uh so no with Brian and just circling back to your original question, um, you know, it's just been a real dream opportunity and and grateful. I can't believe it's been six, six years um in this program with Brian and and the team and hopefully many years to come as we continue to develop uh the brand and hopefully keep winning races yeah the last little while they've really kind of shaped a, a pretty impressive motorsports program not just in tcr but like wrc have you ever had any connections or experiences with the wrc team at all or seen those cars or met the drivers 
So we've been to Alzenau, which is where Hyundai Motorsport is in Germany, and um, a couple trips there. And so that they do all the the customer racing TCR work and the WRC work under the same roof. Um, and so we've seen it, and it's a it's an incredible operation. And I've obviously been very successful on the WRC side, um, and TCR customer racing globally has been very successful. So it was it was cool in the early days. Um, uh, to to sort of see that growth uh, to as as more product became available and um, you know just the early days when uh, Gabrielli uh, Tarquini uh, came over and he's just such a force and did a lot of the development work on these cars in the early days and so he's like this is how you need to drive it and you know this is what it likes and just just really getting to hit the ground running from from grassroots and and seeing it uh, where all the magic happens in Europe um, has been. Have been really cool. Describe one of the biggest challenges that you can remember facing during your racing career. That's a good, that's actually a good question. I mean, I think, I think it's probably the mental game, honestly. It's it, like we talked about earlier, it's just getting out of your head and, and being focused on the task you have, especially when things aren't going that well. And sometimes things just don't go that well. And, you know, you're, you're, you feel like you're behind. You're not getting the results you should be getting. You have some bad luck. You know, it's easy to go from feeling really great and confident in racing to feeling like, you know, you forgot what you're doing. And I don't know how many times I've had that where you have a bad session and you immediately think like, why, why, what, why, did, why am I all of a sudden off the pace? Like, well, I wasn't off the pace and you can, you can get caught up and go, well, am I not driving right? Am I missing something? There's something wrong with the car. You can get so caught up. And so I think that's kind of one of the big challenges is just, again, just like compartmentalizing and going, okay, well, that session wasn't very good, but why? Let's just work through it. Maybe there's something we missed on the car. Maybe there's something in the setup that didn't work. You know, I'm pretty sure I didn't forget how to drive from the, you know, a month ago when we won to now, for example, it's like, but you, these things kind of go through your head. And, and so just, just focusing on that that present moment and just working forward um, to to getting the best you can out of it every session. And then what you typically find is, oh no, everything was fine. You know, we just had a couple of things we missed with the car. And once we got that sorted out, we were right back on track. And so it's just just yeah, keeping keeping the mental side of it in check and and really just focusing on what you're what you're doing at the time and focusing forward, I guess. Do you have any engineering or mechanical background at all, or like is communicating feedback on the setup, whether it's for iRacing or uh, Brian Hurt Autosport? Is that something you've had to kind of develop and learn through your career? Yeah, that's a good question. I I don't have any specific background there, so it's really just. The learnings of racing for a long period of time, just trying to figure out how to communicate with engineers so that I can relay information that they can interpret to changes on the car. Um, and I think I developed that. So I spent a lot of years, about a decade with AIM Autosport and, um, um, you know, uh, Ian and Keith and Andrew Bourdain. I mean, they, they we spent a lot of time talking about dampers and, and just general setup and work through it on multiple cars from Formula Ford to Daytona Prototype, um, just honing in on what I'd call like an education in motorsport. And it just takes time to really understand it all. And when you can communicate good information to your engineer and you can break the corner phases down and, you know, you tell them what they need to know to, to turn that into a change. And obviously as time goes on, you start to pick up on what change would be beneficial for that, that problem. Um, and, and so absolutely, like it's been more of an education and working with a number of engineers and just trying to figure out what clicks as far as, um, being efficient with feedback, um, you know, having productive discussions, you know, we always do, do track sheets and notes and, and try to, uh, relay, you know, back car balance type feedback on all the corners, but it's not just that it's, it's, um, you know, how the car goes over the bumps. It's, uh, you know, how confident the car is on entry or, you know, finding that, uh, that the right balance point um, for a given part of the race stint. Because with front wheel drive, we obviously use more front tire. Um, so, you know, figure on longer races, it's figuring out how to get the best balance at the right time to to be competitive when when you need to be. So there's a lot of those factors. And yeah, I think it's just experience really. I want to spend the last couple of minutes here just talking about, you said you have a background in marketing. So I want to kind of go into 
building a personal brand and fostering relationships with sponsors and um, what that's been like for you and any advice that you might have for some of our drivers um, in Canada or some, you know, some of the kids who are looking to get into professional racing, but maybe just don't have the knowledge and skill set and finances yet. Yeah, I, I, so my background, um, I've got a degree in in automotive business from Georgian College, and um, and you know I just that was just the right fit for me. So learning a little bit about marketing and and a lot of that is around sort of more dealer specific. Um, and to be honest with you, I was racing when I was doing that, and so I've been racing ever since. So I haven't had to sort of apply it in the same way that maybe a lot of my peers did uh, that have you know gone into the automotive profession. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously tricky, um, you know, getting the, getting support, uh, in the day of social media and that there's a lot of different ways to try to try to gain support in that. But, uh, to be honest, I've always found that part of it and, and getting the sponsorship and, you know, keeping everybody happy and with deliverables of that it's, it's, a it, it's tricky. Um, and I've, but I've always found like from a driving standpoint, you know, working for a manufacturer and understanding what their goals are and what they're trying to get out of it and ultimately why they're racing um, is, is really important. Um, you know, speed and lap time and performance are really important, but I always say they're a part of the puzzle. They're not the whole pie uh, or they're, you know, a piece of the pie, not the whole pie, because there's just so many other factors. Um, you know, you, you obviously uh, need to deliver off track media wise, um, marketing events. Uh, if you're promoting the road car via social or doing a track day or dealing with owners, like there's just a lot of factors there that need to come together. Um, and that builds kind of the whole the whole package. And so that my, my advice to younger drivers is, you know, if you work for a manufacturer, you work for something, you're representing them. So you're a driver, you obviously want to win, your goal is to win, but you're representing this bigger picture. And so those decisions you make on track and the way you deal with your your co-drivers or your teammates, um, it has to be uh, you know very team focused. It's not about you, it's about the team. And that um, ultimate goal of, well, what's what's the main focus? And and when you're with a manufacturer, it's winning manufacturer's championship. So if your co-driver is leading and you're second and you can make a pass to maybe win, but mm, there's a chance that it could end up in tears, um, you would really have to think about that because at the end of the day, a one, two for the manufacturer is a fantastic result, even if you're not the number one. So there's there's the kind of that whole, how the, how the whole picture unfolds. And so, yeah, definitely advice there. Uh, would be to just, uh, you know, be fast, be smart, um, and, you know, be a great representative for, for, um, for that manufacturer. Do you think in the eyes of Hyundai Motorsport is the phrase uh, win on Sunday, sell on Monday still applicable in the modern world? I'd say absolutely it is. I mean, I think the growth of, of a brand and, and being in motorsport is, is they go hand in hand. And we see that all the time with our with our fans, our owners that come. I mean, at Watkins Glen, uh, at our at our activation, we would just ask people that were walking by, you know, if you if you have a Hyundai N, come see us. And people start coming up. I have an Elantra N. I have an Elantra N. A Kona N. It's like so from the early days where you wouldn't even ask that because their the brand was so new. You know, now we have people that have bought. And are loving their ends because we're racing them. And so that the, the connection there is real. Um, dealing and talking with lots of end clubs throughout North America. Um, absolutely, the success on track has been a, a factor in their decision to buy. Um, and I think taking the road car out and lapping it, like I've done, I think I'm on uh, my current car, I'm on my third set of tires. And I did a Tale of the Dragon trip. Um, I've done countless track days. And so I always like to talk about it and say to people like, I'm not driving the car easy. I drive it like I drive the race car and like they go hand in hand. Like this is, they are one in the same in terms of the, the feedback and the character and the fun to drive factor. And I think, you know, that, that gets relayed to prospective buyers and owners love it. And every owner I see, I'm, the first thing I say is, have you tracked it? 
And if they say no, I'm like, you are missing out. You got to go like, take it. And a lot of times it's like, they just have never done it before. So it's a new experience for them. And, and uh, so it's just fun to see that and, and be a part of that for sure. Hyundai is a, a great example for that too, I think, because the motorsports program is so new and at least, yeah, definitely in my eyes, I see what you're saying. It has kind of changed a, a different look of the brand and, and with the whole end program, like we were talking about the rally and obviously, yeah, TCR. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's, uh, there's a lot of motorsport pedigree in the design of the, the current end cars uh, with Albert Bierman, um, you know, his influence uh, and career um, at BMW M before coming over to Hyundai. I mean, he's built some fantastic cars. So everyone, when he, when the, the, the new end cars started coming out with the Veloster and, and, and then Elantra and Kona, we knew these were going to be real, really great, fantastic track oriented products that would be super fun and that's exactly that's exactly what they are do you think and i know this is probably going to be more speculation and not so much expected you to have the answer to this question but do you think hyundai motorsport we could ever see in like the top class at le mans or kind of like what toyota has been doing or kind of touring car and what relates to their production models more is what they're going to stick with yeah i think for now um tcr has been a is a big part of of um you know, um, relating the, what they sell, um, to what they race. And so that's been a great model for them and, and been really successful. Uh, as far as like future, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. I mean, obviously there's, there's kind of a lot going on in the industry. Things are changing a little bit. There's more electrification happening and there's, there's, and that's, I know a very big part of, of what Hyundai's doing as well. Um, with like Ionic 5, the Ionic brand, um, Ionic 5 and Ionic 6, um, and there's also the fun, uh, first all electric, uh, Hyundai, uh, N model with Ionic 5N, um, which is, uh, going to be out, I think in the early part of next year, uh, but will be released. Um, we'll see more pictures of that, uh, I believe in the next week. So there's a lot of excitement in like a different capacity too there and, and, you know, N performance will, um, we'll have a few different flavors, uh, if you will, moving forward. Where can we find you on, or anybody watching, find you online, which where's your social media? Yeah. So I'm most active. I'm on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter primarily. Um, Instagram is where I'm most active, uh, at Mark Jeremy Wilkins. Um, and that's where I try to post as much as, as possible. And, uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the spot. Before we go, do you have anything, uh, you kind of want to promote or, or anyone you want to shout out quick before we wrap it up? Um, just, just a huge shout out to, to Chris, um, Chris by, um, you know, Brian, uh, Brian Herta and Sean Jones, um, Hyundai, uh, for their support, uh, and just, just a really cool opportunity to be able to, to race, to do two Canadian races this year and, um, on, on you know, one of my favorite tracks. And I was for the last few years hoping that we'd have this opportunity. So no, just really grateful to them um, for, for the opportunity to make this happen and just try to go out there and put on a good show with, uh, you know, the many uh, talented Canadian drivers that you guys have in the field. It's going to, it's going to be a great time and looking forward to some really fun, hard race. Well, we appreciate you so much for spending this time with us and um, we're looking forward to meeting you in person. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Still going bad on you anyway. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ah! I can feel like 80 rest in my Marys. Me and Drizzy back to back is getting scary.